High Tech Oils. Available from Auto One, Sprint Auto Parts, and all leading independent auto stores. Hi, and thanks for joining us today on the show as we take a look at the mid-season review of Andrew Drag Racing. Unfortunately, the weather played havoc up in Queensland last weekend, forcing the cancellation of the Santos Super 3 Extreme Drag Race. So we decided we'll check out some of the highlights of this shortened Andrew Drag Racing series. Rusty Gregory joins me, and already, it may be a short season, mate, but plenty of highlights already. We've seen some massive highlights, it has to be said. World record runs, we've seen some events rained out, packed crowds across the country. It's been quite the start to the Andrew Championship season. Now, with the gap in this, we've now got probably three or four weeks before we get really serious in Sydney for two really big events, including the Nitro Champs, which we'll talk about during the show, and of course the Winter Nationals. Well, the Nitro Champs promises to be one of the biggest events that we've had on the calendar for quite some time. Big, big entry list, especially in top fuel. We're looking at upwards of 11 or 12 cars potentially in top fuel, so promises to be a huge event, and these championships are really gonna go down to the wire. There's plenty to talk about. We've got some special guests joining us on the panel here today. We're gonna cover all of your Group 1 categories in Andrew Drag Racing. Here's what's to come. Coming up on today's show, we dissect the 2015 Andra Drag Racing Series season to date, taking a look at all Andra Group 1 categories. Top Fuel Motorcycle gun rider Chris Porter joins us on the panel to talk about his season so far. And Top Fuel driver Mark Mariani also joins us as we preview the upcoming Nitro Champs at Sydney Dragway. Well, like we said, a lot to get through on today's show as we review the Andrew Drag Racing Series 2015 Championship. Let's talk about top alcohol because this category has really burst onto the scene some massive times we saw at the early event this year in Perth. Yeah, we did, and it has to be said, uh, probably the standout performer for mine was Craig Glasby. Uh, comes out, he's not a guy who races a lot across the championship season, but does a lot of racing over in Perth, particularly at their local rounds of the, uh, of the track championship over there. But when he does step up into top alcohol, he runs well. He's a former event winner in this class, stepped up and ran 5.41 in his top alcohol funny car. At the time, the quickest alcohol funny car run in the world. It was an incredible performance. I've done a lot of events at the Perth Motorplex over the past few years. I can't remember an event that was so emotionally charged that weekend. Glassby wanted to do it, went out there and went 5.41. We had seven drivers just in eliminations alone that went 5.4 seconds, quite phenomenal. It was an incredible event. It, it, there's no other word for it. Just the quality of performances and the, the parity between all the cars. We have quite a few top alcohol funny cars these days competing in there with the dragsters. And that level of parity, it's not easy to achieve. And I think the way that the rules have gone as far as the adjustments over the last couple of years, they've really got that parity on level where it means if you can qualify in the field in top alcohol, you've got just about as good a chance of winning as anybody else. And once again, Gary Phillips stamped his authority. He was pretty fired up that weekend. I know that he lost a record early in the night. He was hungry to get that bit back between his teeth, but I think he'd be relishing, Rusty, the fact he's got some stiff competition out there. The Glasbys, the Cannulis, or Steve Ham, who's not going to defend his championship this year. But guys, they've closed that gap now, haven't they? They really have closed that gap. And you've got to remember Gary Phillips, he's a 17-time national champion, uh, 16 in top alcohol and one in top door slammer. He's hunting that 18th national title. And to date, well, he's doing pretty well, it has to be said. He's two from two as far as event wins go. He's running very, very consistently around that 5.4 second zone, running some really good speeds as well. They've really got that car dialed in. 
John Canooley, got to say a big shout out to their team. That experience over in the USA at the end of last year was very, very rewardful to the team. Yeah, it was. And uh, we saw the performances come to the fore down in Adelaide just a few weeks ago for the Canooley team. Uh, they were one of the top three quickest quickest cars that we had on the premises in that uh, in that field. And so for the Canooley team, they're, they're a team that has really, they've had all the gear for a long time, but it's just a matter of putting all the right pieces in at the right time. And uh, they're really starting to come together and they're, they're a definite championship contender this year. And also great to have some new names back in the championship, including Victorian Rob Ambrosi, who rejoined after 12 years and was instantly on the money. Yeah, he is. Not the quickest car in the field, it's got to be said, but certainly he's a guy who, if any of the big guys sneeze, he's right there to capitalise on, uh, on those mistakes. And also to the likes of the lone female like Debbie O'Rourke, who's been punching above her weight here this year again, Rusty. She really has. A lot of people would say that, uh, that her husband's punching above his weight, but uh, <laughs> Debbie O'Rourke is certainly punching above her weight as far as uh, up against teams that have got a much bigger budget. But this team's got a lot of heart. You know, they, they run a top door slammer as well as a top alcohol car. And uh, when you see the performances that she puts in, she really drives this car 110%. And it's showing because at the moment she's fourth in the points after two events. Some young guys that have come through, including Shane West and Wasn't, the dream run that he had back in 2014. Unfortunately, that car didn't get off the trailer. And we're hoping to see him hopefully get a budget one day to come on the road with us. I'd love to see some of these young blokes from over in Perth uh, really do all rounds of the championship because Shane Weston, he's an exciting young talent. He uh, has been driving these cars since he was a teenager and uh, I'd love to see him over on the East Coast. So hopefully uh, somebody somewhere corporate can get behind him. Let's talk Adelaide quickly, a track that's come back onto the scene in Andrew Drag Racing in the recent past. And again, we saw plenty of new records in 1,000 feet racing. Yeah, we did. We saw some really, really competitive times down around in that mid four second zone. Uh, of course, Gary Phillips uh, ended up winning that event, but we saw really strong performances from guys like Steve Reid and, uh, and John Canooley, who we've already talked about. Steve Reid, great to see him back in the championship as well. Uh, he's running fifth in the points as it stands at the moment, but uh, that is a car that can win on just about any given Sunday. Well, let's talk about points because Gary Phillips is already shutting down the championship. In fact, we'll take a look at it right now. Gary Phillips, 226 points. It's nearly 140 over John Canooley now. Craig Glasby sits in third, but they're a long way off. So it's going to be a two horse race effectively. Debbie O'Rourke is next. Stephen Reid, Rob Pilkington, Rob Ambrosi and Gary Bush are the names inside the championship so far in Andra Top Alcohol. Time to look at Andra Top Door Slammer right now. And once again, the championship is ablaze, but the man John Zapier has only got a few rounds to do it this year to secure his eighth championship and he's well on his way, Rusty, to doing that after a stellar run in the first few rounds. Yeah, he's 136 points ahead in the championship, it's got to be said. And looking at the names of the guys that are chasing him down, it's a different field of competitors that are immediately behind him in the points, but it's the same name at the top, isn't it? John Zapier. The guys like uh, Peter Capiris and Stuart Bishop, who are really knocking on the door of, uh, of John Zapier over the last couple of seasons, well, they've fallen by the wayside when you look at it, and uh, it didn't start well, especially for Stuart Bishop over in Perth. I, I couldn't believe that night when we were sitting there because earlier in the season in domestic racing Zap did a 571 I think off the top of my memory and he goes out and does a 568 and everyone thought oh this is the year to catch Zap and he just goes out and gaps him again. It, the, the consistency of that car is just incredible and, and I've said it before John's had the same crew for a long long time he's had the same suite of sponsors the same car the same chassis builder he's kept everything the same and consistency is what wins races in top door slammer John Zapier he just keeps finding ways to go out there and win but got to give a big shout out to Morris Fabietti a big career resurgence this year in that Holden Trade Club Monaro yeah and it was the career personal best over there in Perth for Morris Fabi up, Fabi Fabietti up there I should say a great job to him to get that Holden Trade Club Monaro back up there, but I don't know what they're going to do about Zap. He's just getting quicker and quicker, and the guys just aren't catching him. It's now over a tenth of a second. It is over a tenth of the second, but you know things turn in top, top door slammer pretty quickly. Uh, just go and ask uh, Stuart Bishop, for example, was knocking on the door of the championship last year, had that big, big accident that we saw at, at the Nationals in Sydney, and let's be honest, the car hasn't really behaved the same since then. Uh, so things change very, very quickly in Top Door Slammer. Yeah, and to give you an idea, that car was being repaired for the time, between the time it left Sydney in November, it arrived at Perth with three days to go and the paint was still wet on there. They had Christmas Day 
and a couple of other days off over that period to have the car ready and I thought that was an awesome effort to get that car back. Absolutely. Another guy, Marty Dack, uh, run it up at the Nationals last year, last round of the championship. He's continued that good form on to, uh, to season 2015. Currently running fifth in the points and he had a really good showing over in, uh, in his hometown in Perth. Pino Priolo is one I want to talk about also. He finally broke away from the red light syndrome he'd been having for a few rounds now. Unfortunately, bit him in the first round but would make it on to a final at the Adelaide round. I think those guys have made big leap forwards in their championship tilt. Again, another guy who's not the most quick or not the quickest car in the field, but he's certainly one of the most consistent performers. And it's taken them a few years to really get on top of the setup in that car. Now that they've found the setup, I think they're very, very happy with where they're at. They're knocking on the door of, uh, of mid 590s, low 590s, and that'll win you a lot of races in top door slammer. You've got to remember the big key, the big key is just qualifying in the field. Once you're in the field, anything can happen. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. We go back to Perth, just that alone, we had 0.296 of a second covering eight cars in qualifying for the first round alone. And get this, there was 12 personal bests across ETs and speeds in qualifying alone over there. So you need to hit the ground running. Nobody doesn't like to qualify at the best of times, but you can't afford to do that in this such short championship that we have. And nobody knows that better than Peter Kapiris. He is a former national champion in this class, uh, has really been out in the wilderness, I think it has to be said, over the last couple of seasons. Ever since he lost that championship back in 2013 to John Zapier on that one run, the very last run of the event, uh, the very last run of the season as well, um, it just hasn't come together for Peter Kapiris. And again, this season really struggling way, way down in the bottom half of the top 10 in the points. Yeah, and to think that car was so quick last year. When he failed to qualify at Adelaide, I think the team will go back now and really have a think about things when they come back to Sydney because that track's always been good to him in the years. It has. It's been very, very good. And uh, it's a happy hunting ground for him, especially for Mark Brew, his crew chief. Uh, I know those guys have got a, a lot of tricks up their sleeve and uh, I know they're going to be pulling all that pulling out all the stops at the Nitro Champs in Sydney. Got to say also, Daniel Gregorini did another great job over there in the West. The West have always had some tough drivers, and that's purely to the fact they get a lot of domestic racing, which has been a talking point across Australia, because these guys get eight to 10 races per year where they can go and run in different brackets over there. Yeah, on top of the National Championship trail. You look at the list, you know, John Zappi is leading the points. You've got Pino Priolo, Marty Dack, Daniel Gregorini, Wayne Keyes is another guy, mm. Pat Carboni. There's so many tough blown alcohol cars from over in the West. The same goes to top alcohol. It's the same deal in both of those classes. You get the runs on the board, you get the data on the cars and the wins will come. Grand O'Rourke also continued his form from winning that event last year in Adelaide at the Spring Nationals. I also got to say a big shout out to Pat Carboni, who held on to number one qualifier there for a long, long time in Adelaide and then got bumped down the field. But those guys also starting to make inroads with their entry. Really starting to come to the fore as far as uh, the, the, the diversity in this class because, uh, you know, guys, again, like Murray O'Connor, Pat Carboni, like you touched on, they're all guys that can run really, really quick times and they're guys that, well, if you slip up a little bit, they'll be there to bite you. Well, let's take a look at the points in the championship so far and they're gonna are they gonna stop John Zapier. Hmm. It's gonna be a hard one. He's 136 points clear at the moment of Morris Fabietti who sits in second doing a good job there. Then there's this little gap between Pino Priolo, Marty Dack, Grant O'Rourke. Those guys will fight it out to the end. Daniel Gringarini, Peter Capiris and Wayne Keyes are the top eight in the championship so far as we enter the last two rounds of the championship. Let's take a look at Pro Stock Motorcycle now. Their first round of the championship happened in Adelaide at the VPW Pro Series 1000. Might have been light on numbers, Rusty Gregory, but we had a new name, even though he contested the round in October, really shoot to prominence. Ryan Learmont, it's a name you're going to hear a lot of over the next couple of seasons. Contesting, I think, the, the full championship this season, hopefully. And uh, I tell you what, for a young guy, he went out there, he made the final round at the first round of the championship down in Adelaide. He was not intimidated, was he? No, and they've put a lot of investment into this bike this year. Of course, second generation racer from Western Australia. Long way to come and do it in the championship this year. Now, they made a decision, now it's three rounds, we'll contest a lot. And he really took it to Morris Allen in that final in Adelaide there. It was quite a burn down, wasn't it? It was a huge burn down. Went for, uh, I think, upwards of 45 seconds uh, on the start line. It was uh, something like we haven't seen for a long, long time in pro bike. Let's take a look at it now. The final from the VPW Pro Series 1000 at Adelaide. These guys were close in qualifying, but in the first round of racing, Morris Allen ran that 7 2 double zero. Now, both bikes are ready to go in here. They're both in pre stage. I think we might have a burn down on our hands here, chat. Oh, here we go. Okay, there's no rules as to who has to go in first. Now, Ryan Limon <laughs> did say before this run, he said, There is no way I am staging first. <laughs> the starter says, Let's do it. And neither are budging. We've got ourselves a good old fashioned burn down. 
Uh, this is what it's about, building the tension on the start line. Who's going to blink first? Look at the deep breath that Morris is taking. That's a very relaxed style right there for Ryan. A couple of phantom revs. Once again, the starter says, let's get in there. This is great stuff. And Morris is looking for the beams. There you go. And they both are fairly slow at the tree as a result. The race is on. But it's all Morris Allen. Silver Christmas tree. It was an amazing run, wasn't it? We saw him go down the track, but geez, he held down Morris Allen at the start line there. Nothing in it. The guys were just having a bit of fun at the other end. There was no intimidation factor whatsoever for Ryan Learmont. You've got to remember, Morris Allen is a former national champ. He's a guy who's run consistently in the top two of the championship over the last couple of seasons. And uh, to go up there against a rookie and be held out like that for 45 seconds on the start line, incredible stuff. Talk about consistency. We talk about Darwin's own Scott White who come back down. He's chasing the championship full time for the fourth time in his career and unfortunately it went all wrong in the semi-finals. He's a guy who's really, really laid back about his racing. Very, very passionate racer from the Northern Territory. But uh, there was an incident in that, uh, that race in Adelaide that really got his attention. Uh, had a problem with a, a big chunk of the, uh, the motorcycle, the fairing on the motorcycle, come off, grabbed the wind, it nearly threw the motorcycle over on him. But his experience came to the fore, put the foot down, even burnt a hole through his boot. It was that, uh, it was that close. But did a great riding job to pull it up. And you're talking about the ducktail on the back of the bike there too. They're worth a few thousand dollars and there was a lot of uh, speculation whether that bike may not make it for the rest of the championship, but I believe it will be now. Yeah, fortunately it does look like uh, he will be back for the Nitro Champs, so that is good news. And uh, it's looking like a really solid field again in Sydney for the Nitro Champs. We also saw uh, Lockie Island make an appearance back out there. Those guys did a bit of R&D for a full assault at next year's championship. And Glenn Wooster, who unfortunately had engine damage in qualifying withdrew from the event. Two good guys back in pro stock motorcycle. Absolutely. Lockie Island, former national champion. Again, another one of these guys doesn't always have the quickest motorcycle, but man, he is killer on the tree. I think he went 003 on a pro tree. One flash of the ambers, that's all you've got to react to. And he managed to go anything in double O's is good. And uh, Lockie Island is one of the few guys who can do it consistently each and every time. Sat most of last season out, but good to have them back in the field also. We'll take a look at the points now. And Morris Allen, stranglehold in this championship, 118 points. He's clear of Ryan Learmonth is on 87. Back to Scott White on 66. Lockie Island on 65. And Glenn Wooster getting those 24 points for appearing and qualifying at Adelaide for Pro Stock Motorcycle. Well, it's time to take a break here on the Andrew Drag Racing Review Show for 2015. So much still to come. We're going to catch up with Chris Porter from Top Fuel Motorcycle. Mark Mariani is going to join us from Top Fuel. And later we talk all things Nitro Champs at Sydney Dragway. Stick around. Plenty more to come. Welcome back to the show as we take a look at the midway point of the 2015 Andrew Drag Racing Series here. Joining us on the panel is 2012-2013 Top Fuel Motorcycle Champion Chris Porter. Chris, welcome. Thank you very much. Mate, let's talk about your season so far. Yeah, well, we've had a um, pretty good uh, season, um, sorted out the blow-ups that we've had from the last season, hopefully. And um, yeah, we've got a win up in Perth in the last round, so it's been good. Perth is a traditionally tough track to go to at the best of times. We had five rookies over there this year and they know how to turn it on over there, don't they? Certainly do. It's, it is a very hard track. It's um, yeah, like uh, got lots of inconsistencies in it. It's a good start line and half of the track is slippery and then it comes on at the other end. So you've really got to... The home, the home track guys have got a lot of advantage over us guys that travel from the east here. Yeah. 
Now, over the last season or so, we've seen some pretty spectacular moments from you, Chris. Uh, probably uh, not the least of which was at the Nationals last year. You had that massive explosion off the start line. Uh, first of all, tell us what happened when that uh, when that let go, because obviously it's a bit of an experience with you uh, laying over the top of the engine like that when it does let go. Yeah, it certainly is. That's um, one of the fun parts of the sport. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there we had um, on the testing the week the weekend before that. Um, I had a hydraulic problem there and uh, we were at basically out of the race meeting for that season. I didn't have another set of heads and um, a friend of mine there says to me, I'll whip the heads over to my joint and we'll weld them up and take them down to Duncan Foster and those guys will machine them up and we'll have a go. You know, it was only uh, the last ditch attempt to get into the race meeting so that's what, what happened. We whacked about together and these guys seen the, uh, you know, the end of that. With the result, the end result, that big explosion that we saw, do you actually feel that while you're laying on top of the motorcycle? Do you get any hint that it's coming to brace yourself or anything like that? Um, I don't get any hint that it's coming because it happens that fast. You know, our bikes go from zero to full throttle in under 0.4 of a second. So you're from idle to full noise and then that happened like basically straight off the start line. So um, the first thing I knew about it was the flash and that was the end of it. I felt you can feel it on your chest. Um, we wear protection for that, you know. Um, so that's about all we get from that. Let's talk about round three of the championship over in Perth. We joked off there a moment ago, it's one of the rounds I haven't been to in the past couple of seasons. You picked up the win over there, but it was a busy, busy weekend and lots of awesome racing. Oh, certainly it was. With the two rounds, with the round robin thing that we've got going on in Perth there, everyone's basically, you've got to top qualify off the trailer, which is hard, you know, if everyone knows a time off your bike, you've got to come out with tow over there and after four months off your bike, I and mean, you get on it and you've got to be in the field on the straight away on the day, yeah. Do you feel rusty after that amount of time off the bike? Oh, you certainly do, yeah. It's like anything, if you've done it every weekend, you know, and it's a go through the routine, it's not only me, but my crew guys are the same thing. There's little bits and pieces that you get after two or three qualifying rounds that you pick up and you're back, oh, yeah, I forgot to do that, I forgot to do that. But when you go straight into racing, we don't have that really um, flexibility of um, missing that last little switch or turning that right knob and the keys can go bad in a big way, yeah. Now, one guy that we know has been really hard to beat over the last season or so is Mark Drew. He reset the national record at that event, well, it went 6.34 for your class of motorcycle, the V-twin uh, top fuel motorcycle. Uh, what does it mean for the class to have a bike of that calibre in there, and how difficult does it make it for guys like you who are out there trying to run with a, a local product? Um, yeah, well, it's, um, it's good for the class because obviously Mark um, has been uh, racing for a bit and he's been tr trading his bikes out backers and forwards from America, selling them to the guys here, go and get a new one, upgrading basically to the, the best one that he could get hold of, which is the one that he scored, you know, and um, it's good that he's there running because he's running some good numbers and it shows that the fuel hollies can run some good numbers, you know, they're running six ones in the state, so I mean six one to a six three in basic timing is not much, it's a lot of drag racing, but you know, um, it's hard for us um, local wise because the bike came with the tune ups and everything in the laptop from America. I was there with Mark and loaded Mark and I are good mates. And um, basically it was just the last ten passes I've seen it were all six twenty passes. So the hard part for Mark is transferring that data to the Australian conditions and getting the bike which she seems to have got on top of it. We've seen a lot of races come and go over the years. We had a quiet period a couple of seasons back, but we've seen a resurgence this year in top fuel motorcycles, some big numbers at the rounds. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, I mean, uh, obviously, like my bike, um, we've had the big blow-ups. I mean, had the, over the last, since the winners, um, trouble trying to get on top of the head problem. That was the thing that we had going. I got a new set of heads from UPM for the last meeting in Perth and obviously come back out and then run a 70. Um, the first pass was obviously the first. I was more jittery than anything else because I wasn't sure what it was going to do. And um, that's why, you know, a lazy 750 and then a, a 670 the next one. Well, we're turning the tire, if you've seen on the video, your bike's doing this stuff, it's actually turning the tyre with the front wheel in the air, trying to unfold itself. And so we're you know, making that much power at half track or on the shift. But, um, it'll, it'll run, it'll run good numbers, yeah. We talked about Mark Drew before setting the national record for the V-Twin class. Let's take a look at that awesome pass from the Perth Motorplex at the latest round. Ugly stuff for Macon, wasn't quite prepared. And a huge run for Drew. National record at both ends, 371 wow. kilometres per hour. It's a low 6.30 to boot. This guy is unstoppable. Wow. It actually looked like he calmed it down a little bit for that run. He's a hard man to beat at the best of times, but certainly on home ground. Mark Drew resetting the national V-twin record in top fuel motorcycle over there.
at the Perth Motorplex earlier this year. Chris, we should talk about that because only recently we've introduced the two car classes inside Top Fuel Mot Motorcycle with the V-Twins and the multi-cylinders. Let's have a chat about that. Yeah, we've got the two classes, like I said, Top Fuel Multi and Top Fuel Twin for the Harley. So um, it's pretty good for us because obviously the metric bikes, um, Chris Madison in particular, um, a lot quicker bikes than us. So um, for us to have our own record is a good thing to change for. You talk about Chris Matheson, he's a guy who's got three national titles under his belt, very experienced racer, but he stepped across onto the Harley, which is sort of foreign territory for him these days. Has he asked for any advice as far as riding the bikes? Because they're very, very different, aren't they? Yeah, sure does. Like Chris and I are really good mates, you know, I've spent a lot of time in his workshop and um, I've stayed at his house a few times at Willow Bank or whenever that's on, I always go up a week early and hang out with him, you know, he's a good guy. And, um, we actually, if you go through the process with Chris when he gets a new bike, he's pretty psyched on his stuff and he has a set way he does stuff, so he'll sit on the bike and set and lay on the bike and go for his thing and he'll do that for an hour in the shed, you know, just to get into the zone, you know, so, and um, when he first got the bike, because the metric bike total different to the Harley where the metric bike, they bang them up to 8,000 whatever RPM and for their burnouts with the Harleys, we get lucky to get three, three and a half. If you start cracking the throttle like that, you'll blow the engine, so I had to try and slow him down and trust the horsepower, the torque of the bike to do the burnout rather than the revs of, of the metric bike, you know? Why do you race these bikes? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've got off the bike, I've seen you that many times get off the bike at the other end and you can't wipe the smile off your face. There's gotta be something that makes you wanna keep coming back and do this. Yeah, it's the need for the speed, man. Running over 200 miles per hour on two wheels, it's gotta be a rush. It, it, they're not easy motorcycles to ride though, are they? You really need to throw your weight around on them. It, does it help to be a bigger sort of guy when you're riding these motorcycles? Uh, I think it does um, because, like I said, we, um, they say we ride them, we don't. We just turn the twisty thing and hang on to the back. They go where they want, they do what they want. We just uh, jockey along, you know. So, um, yeah, 200 miles an hour, it's the funny other racers will notice that when you get to 200 miles an hour, you can tell because you've got the, um, like the lightsaber effect when you're riding. When you get to 200, it goes away and the bike goes quiet. You can't hear anything, it's just like you're in the zone best place in the world and then the next thing the finish line comes up and you shut it and all comes rushing back and you've got to try and not stop on this thing you know. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the riders are in the field now and you've raced against some of the tough ones. I'm looking down the list here guys like Greg Durack is back this season. Terry Burnett coming to terms with his bike but I was impressed the guy over there called Les Holden who did well at the first couple of rounds. Yeah the little Les and the little carbureted high gear bike from Highway Racing. Um, there have been um, boys have been going over there and learning how to ride. Johnny Vick is the owner of Hyo. I think he's been out here. I'm um, actually talking to the guys and that, and um, they've added a couple of them bikes to the class. It's good um, lower end carbureted nitro bike to get into the class. Championship wise, we've only got two rounds to go. Then next year we go back to the traditional Andrew calendar. It's just a case of getting through now, preparing for the new season, or do you think you can take it up? Um, I'd like to think. Well, I'll, of course, I think I can take it up. We always go to the win. You don't go there to run second. Um, fifty points. I think about the difference between Mark and I. And it's hard to make fifty points up in two rounds. You know. Um, but there's, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen, you know. Well, I mean, Mark Drew, he beat himself at the last round of the championship, crossed the centre line on a bye run, which is uh, very, very unusual. Uh, a lot of people expected to see him going back to back as far as the race wins go. Did that give you a sniff for the championship? You've got that, that sniff of a victory there, so you can really try and chase it down? Uh, yeah, it sure did. And Mark's the kind of guy, like, he, he, he doesn't go out and run half throttle on anything. He's got to go full pass every time on that bike because... He's chasing the national records and stuff, you know, not just the actual points. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, you see guys lose or they beat themselves. Well, it kind of does it. That gives you, oh, well, that's, uh, you know, oh, well, I can get a bit of a go here, you know. I mean, um, I was supposed to run Mark. I got a runner up to him in the first round. And we, went, we started the bike, went to toe out and I broke a rocker arm. So I never actually got to race Mark um, in their both race rounds. Well, let's talk about the points as we enter the final two rounds of this year's championship. And it is Mark Drew who leads the points by 55 over Chris Porter. We go back to Greg, Chris Matheson in third position. Greg Durack is next. Ben Stevens, Terry Burnett, Les Holden and Mark Ashelford completing the top eight in the championship so far. Chris, thanks for joining us. Good luck at the Nitro Champs and the Winter Nationals. Thank you very much for having me. Chris Porter joined us here today. As we check out some of the high horsepower action, let's slow it down a bit with one of our snap-on slow-mo packages.
with just some of the amazing racing in slow-mo this year, thanks to our friends at Snap-On and the Andrew Drag Racing Series. Speaking of Snap-On, we've got one of these high-impact wrenches to give away this year. Just jump onto the Andrew Facebook page and log in your details or grab on the entry forms at the Nitro Champs for your chance to win one of them this year. Joining us on the panel right now is Mark Mariani. Marco, great to have you on the show and let's talk about you and the Make-A-Wisher Foundation. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, guys. Nice to be here, boys. Um, yeah, mate, we're back on board with Make-A-Wish. We trialled it all out last year, and I'll tell you what, they were really impressed. Um, we got them all out there at the last meeting, and drag racing in Australia has impressed them with the family atmosphere. Um, it's not what the people who haven't been racing think. Um, and we love to actually have them on board to actually help out. We, we're trying to give back to some children that need help and it's working all right at the moment. <laughs> I know there's a lot of guys behind the scenes, including Bruce Mott, who've made this happen over the past six to 12 months. And it's something we've never seen in drag racing here. They're getting a lot of benefits out of it though, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are. It's something that we're, um, we're both trialing out. So we'll see who we're, we're gonna help them. They can help us and um, hopefully get everything involved with uh, between drag racing, our team, Make-A-Wish Australia. Um, everyone can benefit from something like this. Bruce has been working towards uh, with Make-A-Wish to getting a celebrity ambassador out to the next meeting. Um, there's all these little things that we wanna improve. Um, you can't do it all at once, so each time we'll go and work on something new and try and make a bigger, bigger package each time we come out. Now, it's not just about the relationship, isn't it? It's all about building the awareness for the Make-A-Wish Australia people, May maybe even getting a few donations along the way from the drag racing community because, as we know, there's a lot of people who are very passionate about charities in drag racing and uh, it's great to see another one involved. Well, that's it. That was the idea from the beginning. We thought, let's uh, let's give back and try and um, raise awareness with a charity. We thought, which one? Um, make a wish. Having the involvement that they had in America sort of gave us the first idea um, and it just flowed on from here that uh, we can maybe achieve even more for Make-A-Wish Australia than what has happened over there. I guess it's fair to say you're wishing the Nitro Champs is not too far away, but we've had some racing in the lead up to that over in Perth. And guys, it's been an amazing start to the championship over there. Damien Harris going on to win back-to-back -back rounds. Back-to-back -back for the Rappasada boys. It's uh, not an easy thing to do in today's atmosphere in top fuel. Very, very competitive. And that, uh, I guess you could say, battle that we saw between the Lamatina uh, clan and the, the Rappasada clan that continued all through last year, well, it's continued on to this year. Even though uh, we've lost one of the drivers, Alan Dobson, from the Rappasada stable, Wayne Newby's really stepped up and is running very, very strong for them. Mark, you've seen top fuel racing over the past few years, only gets it on a limited scale, but these two teams, Rapisata Autosport and Lamartinas, have just gapped the field, haven't they? It's hard, it's hard to take, but they have, haven't they? Well, it is definitely. When you've got uh, two outfits as, as large as that and as professional as that, um, the Lamartinas have been really strong in the past. Uh, the Rapisatas, I think, with uh, young Tino and Santo, um, coming on board just learning in leaps and bounds. The outfit there, also racing in America, um, they're just learning so much and really getting these cars down the track and it goes to show by taking out those first two rounds. Now the Perth Motorplex has always been a track that's promoted fast times, quick speeds and at the latest round we had all six cars go into the four second range. Now we haven't seen an all four second field in four years. It was incredible to see, and you've got to remember it was a one-shot qualifying session as well over there in Perth, uh, racing under the three-round format. So to get all the cars that were in attendance in the four-second zone, it was uh, pretty incredible, and it bodes very, very well for the Nitro Champs. We also saw the debut of Mark Sheen in the Canopy car, if you like, something we've seen a lot in NHRA. Mark, what's your thoughts on that? Look, it's something. It's, um, it's the future. Um, personally, I like uh, having the wind blowing in my face, if you'd put it that way. But uh, the canopy cars is something that's um, is it's happening in America. Um, the Lucas team have obviously worked with Sheehan there because that's the first one that they've built. Um, and good on Mark and his uh, team to go and buy one. Um, I wish them all the all the best, and yeah, hopefully they can get a handle on that one. But. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think it will be the way it goes. It will be a long time in Australia before you see everyone racing a canopy car. But um, I don't mind the idea. It's The safety factor is there as well. You've got to always think about that. Well, unfortunately, as we touched on earlier in the show, though, the Santos Super 3 event has been cancelled up there at Willowbank. So now just two rounds to go in the championship as we take a look at the points in Andrew Top Fuel this season. And Damien Harris, 138 points clear now of 
Phil Lamartina is on 112. Wayne Newby is next, followed by John Lamartina, Anthony Begley and Mark Sheehan of the guys that have contested the championship so far. So it's down to a two horse race now with just two rounds to go. Mark Mariani is going to stick around because after the break, we're going to talk everything Nitro Champs here on the Andrew Drag Racing Review Show. Stick around. Welcome back to the show as we take a look at the 2015 Andrew Drag Racing mid-season review here. We're going to talk about the Nitro Champs very soon, but fellas, during the commercial break, we went back to the subject of canopy cars and the impact it's going to have. Sydney's going to be the first time they've seen the canopy car, but what's it all about to those watching at home? Well, essentially the canopy car, it's a fully enclosed driver capsule. That's that's the thing that you need to remember. The way modern day top fuel cars are, you've essentially got the driving uh, driver's compartment open, as on your car, Mark. But with the canopy car, it, it folds up at the front, folds down, it basically seals the driver in there. The idea is that it keeps fire out, keeps debris out, but there is also an argument that there is a big aerodynamic advantage as far as getting clear air up into the injector hat. Now, Mark, I don't know if you subscribe to that theory, but uh, it's certainly one that's been bandied about over in the States. Oh, mate, for many years, even since Don Gull, it started back in the day. It's been one of those things, you know what I mean? I'd love to see it in an air tunnel myself. I haven't seen it. There's got to be an ability to be able to make an advantage out of it. The safety performances and advantages probably outweigh any wind as an advantage. One of the big tests that we saw with the Canopy car was uh, with Antron Brown at one of the first events that they ran it at. I think it was last year's Winter Nationals. Had a big, big accident and there were actually photos of that car where it looked like there was fire going inside the cockpit. Now, um, it does have a fresh air system on those Canopy cars. Is fire something that would go through your mind if you're sitting there sealed inside that, that car? Uh, you're trapped upside down potentially in that car. It could get pretty nasty, couldn't it? I remember watching that one and I was like, that's a really bad deal. He couldn't get out of that car because of the canopy. Basically, the car was, I'm pretty sure, on its side and he's trying to push out of the canopy. Now, that's not good. He, and his one wasn't fully sealed as per Schumacher's one was apparently the full sealed unit. So we did actually get some burns from that. Um, so yeah, it's the catch 22 there. It's a one more thing to confine a driver in the vehicle if he wants to get out in a hurry. Um, something to definitely think about. I've always been about the safety in the sport and it's priority when we go motor racing, when it's drag racing or circuit racing or speedway, for example. But Getting a field of top fuel cars has been a challenge. If this becomes mandatory for cars to have in Australia in the next few years, I mean, the cost is significant to have one of these canopy cars, isn't it? Well, it's pretty difficult to retrofit these canopies to, to the older generation cars. Uh, essentially, you'd need to have a, virtually a whole new car built because it's not just the canopy on the top of the car, uh, it's a full tub that, that fits inside the chassis yeah. and essentially seals it in there. So it's going to be an expensive deal if it does become mandatory. Fortunately, that's not being talked about at this stage, but uh, at the same time, it, it does have a lot of safety advantages. So it's, uh, it's all debatable at this stage. For so someone like you, Mark, it is, it is a tough deal to put a team on track for a couple of times a year, but to do it for a whole championship, then have the requirement to go to that, that's a big ask, isn't it? Yeah, real big ask, but um, really I don't think it's something that will be asked anytime soon. Um, you'd first have to see it be done in America. Um, once that's implemented, usually uh, the rest of the world follows behind suit within a year or two. Um, so nothing in the near future, I'd probably say. Um, but it's something where it's fair for them to probably say as people come into the sport or buy new cars or make new cars, um, it's a too big an expense. We spend enough money as it is to go and say spend a X amount on putting a canopy in your car. Yeah. 
Well, let's talk about how exciting the racing is because we've got an event that's coming up in a few weeks' time, which I love. One of the first events I ever got to do in my drag racing career, the Nitro Champs boys, both your home tracks, coming up here in the first weekend of May. It's going to be a big event, this one. Uh, not just in top fuel, Mark, but especially in top fuel. But uh, across all the classes, we're looking at uh, full entry lists across all the Antra Championship Drag Racing Series classes, as well as the Summit Sportsman classes as well. It's going to be massive. At this stage, we're looking upwards of 350 to 400 entries, which is just a phenomenal entry list, Mark. Oh, yeah, it's going to be a cracker. It's um, the, the Nitro Champs has always been one of those events that everyone wants to go to. Um, and that goes to show literally everyone wants to go to. So we get the crowds out there as well, which they should come. We're going to have an obus oversubscribed field in almost everything, I'd have to probably say, for top fuel, definitely. Um, and I think you may have a good chance of getting that, uh, that all four second on an eight car field. Very possible for this meeting. It's always been that kind of event. I remember it used to be Friday and Saturday night, happy hour Friday night about 8.30 or 9 o'clock and you just knew we we're gonna see some four second passes and 300 mile an hour passes. But this year, something different. You could win a top fuel start line experience. Now, all of us have had a chance to do it. I highly recommend if you get a chance to do it, but we're given an opportunity this year at the Nitro Champs. It's, uh, it's a really exciting thing. Uh, if you've never even seen a top fuel dragster in the flesh, that's something to experience. But when you're standing down on the start line between two 10,000 horsepower cars, there is nothing on this earth like it. it. It's about the closest thing you can get to standing next to the space shuttle launch. You still get that buzz? <laughs> yeah, you know, you do actually. You just can't help it. It's that, like the slogan, feel the noise. It is. It's, it just goes through your body. It's an experience. It's not just let's go to drags and watch something. Let's go and experience this because it's fantastic. But then not many people get to go and stand behind these things or in between these things. It will blow you away. So whoever wins that is going to be jumping up and down with a smile from ear to ear, I'll tell you that. <laughs> what I've loved about the Nitro Champs over the years is, it's, as you said, it's not just a drag race we go to there. They've really stepped it up there at Sydney Dragway in the past few years where the stuff for everyone for the kids to do. We've even got Matt Mingay coming this year in the Hot Wheels truck. We saw him race earlier this year in Adelaide in the stadium super truck, so it'd be cool to have him along this year. Yeah, it would. Uh, you know, he's one of the, the leading stuntmen in Australia, and uh, as far as stunt drivers goes, there's nobody better in this country. And uh, Matt Mingo, he's a, a big fan of drag racing, did a lot of uh, drag racing events over his early career, so it's great to see him coming back to drag racing. One of the best things is, and I hope they never change it, is you can come into the paddock at no extra charge and come down and meet superstars like you, Mark Mariani. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> No, but that's the whole thing about drag racing. It is. You get in there, you can come and watch us tear a car down from just metres away. Um, come and say hello. People step back a little bit. But drag race, we love to have the fans come up, ask questions. Um, come in, take a photo with the car. Obviously, we're not, we're not in the middle of a thrash. We'll invite you in, but it's, that's the passionate part of the sport. Have, we're passionate about the fans just as much as they are about us. And it's gone back to a two-day format this year. Recent years, it's been a three-day event, or basically Friday afternoon through to Saturday and Sunday, but just two days this year, guys. Two days. It's going to be a very short, sharp, uh, intense event, I think. Uh, and looking at the entry list, uh, again, we spoke about it just off air. Top Fuel, we're potentially looking at upwards of 10, potentially 12 entries on the list. And there is a rumour going around that the Rapposada boys are going to be running four Top Fuel cars at this event. Wow. Big, big commitment from those guys with potentially an American driver, Mark. Yeah, that's pretty huge, hey. But then again, uh, that's Sano. <laughs> so <laughs> time will tell. And um, look, it's only a good thing for the sport. Uh, if, if that is going to happen, mate, um, albeit I'd love to, we'd all love to get out there and kick some American butt, um, put a bit of the Australia versus America yeah. tinge to it. And um, look, frankly, if he brings four cars, then maybe we got we could possibly have a better chance because they're spreading their knowledge over a broader area rather than concentrating on one or two cars. So it's a positive on both sides of the field, I think. Talk about positive, the fact you can go to a round like this and see all your favourite Group 1 categories, I mean everyone from the top 
to the bikes, but you also see all the Summit racing equipment, cars and bikes also. I mean, it's just an, an enormous weekend. Well, the Summit Sportsman Series, they're the backbone of drag racing, Andrew Drag Racing, it has to be said. And it's great that we've got Summit on board this year uh, to support the Summit Sportsman Series. And, and I think the racers are really responding to that support that they've got. They're coming out in droves to, uh, to really race and to, to race hard at the Nitro Champs. When you look at the fields, we've got pretty much full fields in all the classes that are on offer. And uh, with gold Christmas trees on offer, they're going to be very, very hard fought trophies to win. And there's always been this misconception, guys, that Sydney Dragway just runs once or twice a year, but Rusty, they race all season long up there. We do. We race all the year round. Uh, of course, the Atura Track Championship Series uh, running all throughout the year. Next event on May the 30th. So if you want to check out some very, very good quality racing, make sure you do head out to Sydney Dragway. And the website is sydneydragway.com.au. Of course, they race every Wednesday night, weather permitting, of course. There's a whole range of events to check out there at Sydney Dragway. Well, we've previewed this year's Nitro Champs, so why don't we take a look at what happened in 2014. Keep your eyes on the car to the right of the screen, right about here. Richard Caval goes on a ride. Very scary accident, almost American in appearance. The way that car got wind underneath it, a big impact. And when that car landed, it was enough to Jolt Richard unconscious for a few moments. And the whole shot. Tyrant Tremaine should be enough to hold on. But Cavallo drives around him and a 699. Wow. Tight at the tree, you'd expect nothing less. Crowley at half track. Crowley at the finish line. 721 beats a 729. That was an awesome drag race. Scared from Mark Druid and still trying to pull that front wheel up in the end for a 720 wow. as a party. A nice 681 from him, but that pass from Mark Druid was something else. Whoa! That was close. I thought Sutton was going to get the wall. Good drive. Big red light for Marty Dak. He had a stab. Be first to the finish line, but the win will go to Zapria. 584 wow. low ET of the event so far. Oh, big wheel stand, and then it knocked the supercharger off it for Bishop. BK will take the win with a 590. It reminds me of a motocross bike, the way this thing just takes off at half track. Just push the burst panel out. You can see the relief panel just under the supercharger there. Seven on the tree. Kapiris is giving him a race. And Zapier, a wow. 579. Wow. What a run from John Zapier. He needed every single tenth of a thousandth of a second there to get around Peter Kapiris after that hole shot. Massive, massive matchup. Big, big start line advantage to have. Huge hole shot. He converts it to the win and knocks out the championship oh. leader with a 547. Take that. Stephen Ham says. James Rowland is excited for a guy that's usually very reserved. He is pumped. Oh, wow. Wow, that was close for Fry. Really aggressive launch. Oh, that is looking at way too much concrete for a drag racer. You never want to be that sideways. It was aggressive enough, and certainly that's a big, big moment for John Canuli. Huge concussion. There we go, on board. Four. Oh, that's a nice oh, pass for Reid. 5.53 for Reid. He'll take lane choice going into the finals. This is a monster pass. Nothing in it at the start line. Big fire on board for Phil Reed and Phil Lamantina out in the first round of race. It's a great drag race and Alan Dobson is the winner, but Mariani pushed him 488. That was a cracking race. Well, I'll be number one qualifier gone in a big flame across the finish line. Giveris, welcome to the top of your fraternity, brother. Pedal, pedal, pedal for 
John Labatina and Dobson goes three in a row. Just some of the amazing racing from the Nitro Champs that you will see in the coming weeks, as we said, citydragway.com.au. And just a few weeks later, boys, we go to Willow Bank for the Winter Nationals, another awesome event. Going back to, I guess you could say, the uh, the championship drag racing season's spiritual home as far as the end of the season goes. Uh, of course, for many, many years, the Winter Nationals was the final stop on the calendar. Uh, we've reverted back to it this year, and uh, I've got to say, I think it's a good move. Mark, I know you're a big fan of Willow Bank. Mate, I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be the uh, Mariani Fermi Motorsports first outing. Um, we're deciding to go up there, take the uh, Make-A-Wish Top Fuel Dragster for its first little uh, run down the Willowbank track. It's good conditions up there every time we go up. Cold conditions, always. but beautiful for racing. Mate, always beautiful. You will always see numbers up there, which is fantastic. Good side-by-side -side racing. Um, we've done some of our best numbers up there with past teams. Um, definite action. Well, that just about wraps us up for today's show in Andrew Drag Racing. Big thanks to you guys for joining the panel. Thanks for having Thank us, you. Matt. And also a big thanks to Chris Porter, who joined us earlier from Top Fuel Motorcycle. As ever, andrew.com.au for more information. Loads of racing to come up this year, along with our big sponsors, Crocam, Snap-on Tools, High Tech Oils and Arthur J Gallagher. Until we see you again, it's bye for now.